Hello and welcome back and that's right today I want to talk about this the TS855X or a NAS that I've started to start referring to simply as the tank. Now when I was over in Computex a few weeks ago I was there looking at different kinds of NAS solution SSDs switches all kinds of networking equipment really and QNAP had their own partner day and they were showing off little bits and bobs uh, that they had planned both in terms of hardware and software more on the software bits later on this video. Now the Thunderbolt devices they were showing off alongside a bunch of Gen 5 uh, Ryzen power systems really did steal the show. But in amongst all of the releases that they were like kind of showing off, so all of their partners, new and old, was this, like nestled right in the middle. I never really gave it enough attention because at that point the Thunderbolt stuff was high, so highfalutin and the Gen 5 kind of really bleeding edge stuff really took my breath away. But once I went, once I went again, in the middle was the tank because this system was there in the middle really innocuous and its internal hardware what it's capable of all of that was largely overlooked so this is the ts855x and today i want to explain why it is a surprisingly impressive NAS. it's not traditionally powerful it certainly ain't no arm and in today's video we're going to talk about the hardware we're going to unbox it a little bit and we're going to go through and talk about what we like and some things about it that may hmm, make some of us think maybe they could have done a little more but that's enough of that you want to see what you actually get for your money what's included now straight off the bat unboxing this on camera is going to be problematic it's quite a big box i'm just going to move it down here and let's talk about what you actually get for your money. How much money are we talking, by the way? Well, looking around online, pricing for this device is actually, a, it's a bit early doors. It's certainly not available in a lot of locations. Now, on B&H, they had this device provisionally listed at $1,399. Now, I've seen it knocking around as low as $1,250, but I've also seen it going around as high as $15, $15.50. So, do bear that in mind at the moment although i'm saying the price is around fourteen hundred dollars slap a bit of a tbc there on the end depending where you are in the us and of course the rest of the world as that may likely change but let's talk about this and talk about what we get for our money in the tank um, we get standard accessories here so we've got um, a main sleeve here for the UK. It's an internal 250 watt PSU. We also have our standard accessory bag included in there. So what do we get? We get information on our warranty. So the system's got three years of manufacturer's warranty. You can bump that up to five if you choose. Also information on the existing warranty, not just the extension. We've also got information on the first time setup. But again, bit blah you know it's a bit graphical to be honest but you'll find better resources online also we have got screws for two and a half inch and three and a half inch media more on that later on and we've also got keys for each of the individual bays and look at that we got ourselves some heat sinks adhesive heat sinks don't cost much does it i'm glad they're including them so there we go there's those accessories there we've also got a couple of cat 5e cables so not cat 6 but at the same time as much as i would have liked to have seen cat 6 inside this device i didn't really expect it would have gone the extra mile for them to do so and although it is a 10 gbe enabled box i do think there's still a little bit more to be said in terms of ethernet cables and i think brands could really step up a little bit on those not too much because we don't want to waste stuff too much but cat 5e cables if you're going to include cables you know, when most of us have LAN cables, you know, in a business sector knocking around already from pre-existing network environments, at least make them better cables than that. Ramp them up to Cat 6. I'm surprised we're not even seeing some early Cat 7 stuff knocking around. But what about the device? Well, there is all of our packaging. A decent amount of packaging there for us to be dealing with. So let's get that out. We've got the foam. Good bit of foam there to protect the device in transit. Look at the other end, have a good look, nice and hard. Um, while I'm unpacking this, and again, it's very boring unpacking plastic, one of the things I didn't talk about during Computex, largely because a lot of it I wasn't able to take any photos or video, is when I was over in Taipei, they were doing tours of the QNAP manufacturing facility. It was myself and about 30 people, maybe 40, 
and we were given a tour around the QNAP production facility. And to be frank, it, you know, colour me impressed because I'm sure all of the NAS brands have not dissimilar working processes, but whether it was, even whether that entire setup they're running is unique to QNAP or the NAS brands do the same thing, I was still tremendously impressed. For example, when these devices are put together during the production line, photos are taken of every single system, every integer of the production, be it the cutting of the parts, down to the allocation of the individual components, getting set inside, the whole thing, every step of the way, every exchange, photos are taken of every single one and are serial logged. And the result is that at the end of that uh, production fa facility and that workflow of the building of these devices, not only when they went into kind of the uh, burn facility as well, just to see how well they're doing. All of that was serial logged, all of the reports, all of the photos. And ultimately, it did give me a new perspective on the hardware construction of these devices at the production level. So if you want to learn more about that, I'm hopefully going to do another video in the relative near future talking a lot more about that. Not just with QNAP, but we're definitely going to start with QNAP and their production facility and certainly that serial and photo and report logging for every single device and serial. And we want to put that to the test in a video coming up soon where we want to kind of give them a serial number, give them absolutely no warning and see what they can produce off the back of that serial number. But back to the tank, the 855X chassis there. This is not light. It's a metal chassis all around. And ultimately, as far as uh, the kind of accessories in our unboxing part of the video here, it's all fairly middling, middle of the road stuff. It's what we'd expect. It's not going to blow you away. It's certainly well protected. But overall, I think the real proof in the pudding is going to be discussing the design of the TS855X. Now, it must have already struck you that the front bay of this device is ever so slightly different from the bulk of NAS systems we talked about on the channel previously. Not only have we got built here into this metal chassis six SATA bays here, so again, supporting a 3.5 inch SATA media, currently up to uh, 22 TB per bay, and you can gradually populate if you choose. But on top of that, alongside these trays, and we'll talk about the trays in a moment, we've also got 2.5 inch SATA here at the top, in its own dedicated bay as well, supporting up to 15 millimeter height SATA SSDs as well. Now, straight away, as nice as that is that this six, technically eight bay device gives you a nice tiered storage system, more on tiering later, I'm a little disheartened that they are SATA SSDs there. What I mean by that is when you look at um, NASs that came out, even as late uh, as uh, the autumn winter of 2020, when QNAP rocked out the TSH973AX, that was a five hard drive, two SATA SSD, and two U.2 SSD bay system. I kind of am a bit disappointed that these are not U.2. I would have liked that because of the scale and performance it would have given some much, much faster storage media to go in here. Don't get me wrong, a SAR SSD slotting inside there, whether you're going to be utilizing the likes of WD or Seagate or anything, if you did put a SATA SSD in there, yes, it's going to be faster than the hard drive base, but once you've populated it with even three hard drives, the combined RAID performance of those are going to match a SATA SSD. And the benefits that a SATA SSD will grant you then start to deteriorate. And then kind of the, uh, the drop in uh, capacity rears its head as well. Whereas if they've gone for a U.2 drive inside there, you still would have had the option of some of the capacity levels but it would have given us perhaps a 12 gig SAS variant or maybe even U.2 via NVMe SSDs inside here. Maybe like a, a Gen 3 times 2 perhaps. Maybe even Gen 3 times 4 they could stretch it. And it would give you substantially different performance measures possible from the main hard drive base, even in you know a RAID 0, which would be madness, versus the main U.2 base in there. So I like that it's a two tier, three tier system really. More on that later. It's just a shame that they went with SATA, not U.2 SAS. Now, again, the trays are plastic. They're screwless. You can use the screws included if you choose, but even the two and a half inch SATA, it's got clips there on the side. Um, the system also has um, a real-time LCD panel to give you information about the device when it's in operation. It also helps if you put these in right on camera. Um, 
And then with the main base there, each one of those you populate again with two and a half inch um, or three and a half inch SATA. And every one of those has its own LED that can have its brightness adjusted. And there's the standard three tone uh, green, amber and red for running fine. Here's a warning and things just got bad uh, all the way across along with that LCD panel which you can navigate for things like system temperature uh, to if you hear a warning from the system you can navigate exactly what it is on top of that system temperature or identifying individual IPs on the system now there is actually a large cooling section to this whole thing indeed if you go down this area here is occupied by the storage media this whole area here is where the main controller board is and moreover a, uh, a complete fan and um, pulling system that's drawing air through here and utilizing that vent panel on the side to act as dissipation for the air now at the bottom we've got ventilation under each one of the individual bays and we've got the rubberized feet lifting it ever so slightly from the table again all if all fairly standard stuff but the reason i bring it up is and the reason i call it the tank is there's a lot in here and for those six bays there the two SAR bays and we need to talk about the third tier the two m.2 nvme slots inside uh, 2280 length both gen three times four each that three tier storage system in here is going to get warm and the metal chassis might dissipate some of that heat but ventilation is going to be crucial in a nas like this so having that side vent action here alongside ventilation on almost every side is going to be hugely beneficial there. Now we've got USB uh, port there on the front as you would expect. And apart from that, you've got the usual power button. All the trays are lockable, but they're plastic trays. They're so not a huge surprise there. And overall, I'd say the design of this is pretty compact for the sheer amount of storage that it can adopt. I'm talking about storage, we could talk about expandability because the device also supports a myriad of different expansion options. Now, if you want to go for standard desktop expansions, um, this does support two actively at the same time of up to the QNAP 16 by JBOD SAS solutions there, the D1600S. And again, there are two, four, and eight bay desktop solutions as well. But it also weirdly supports the rack mount expansions, not just the usual rack mount ones, but the daisy chain rack mounts, which means it can support up to, but depending on which one you go for, three or four daisy chained 12 to 16 bay expansions which although will look ugly as sin, given it's a desktop and they are rack mounts, it's still nice to have that sheer scalability where the main computing of the NAS and the handling of everything goes here and all of those expansions connected by HD external SAS cards and even greater network connected cards result in a huge amount of storage expanded potential and to easily crack the petabyte layer if that's what you are going for. But for now, why don't we get this turned around and start talking about those ports and connections. Now the port and connectivity of this device is um, I would say understated, but still impressive. As you can see there, we've got our main ports here. We've got loads of ventilation. We've already discussed that, not just withstanding the uh, PSU 250 watt one there, but we've got some USB ports in there. And again, those are standard USB 3.2 Gen 1, unfortunately, again, to do with the CPU inside. More on that later on. Uh, but on top of that, we've also got two 2.5 gigabit ethernet ports there, which of course support SMB multi-channel. So again, call it effectively five gig if you're gonna be utilizing the right direct connectivity. USB network adapters like the five gig network adapter, and of course, loads of $20 USB to 2.5 gigabit Ethernet adapter, so you've got that option to add uh, direct two and a half times traditional gigabit connectivity connectivity between you and the device. But there's also a 10 gig Ethernet port by default, and it's a copper based one as well. And what's really intriguing is it's not on a PCIe card. They have not utilized the two PCI slots that we'll talk about later on in order to allow this to have 10 gig. And then that in combination with the two 2.5 gig ports means this has a potential default network bandwidth of 15 gig to play with there, which again, once you factor in the triple tier storage system inside there, or if you were gonna take advantage of expansions, is actually a decent level of connectivity. Now, at this price point, uh, again, $1,400 TBC, 
I kind of would have liked another 10G, if I'm honest, because you've got to factor in the, hard, uh, the hardware and the software into this. So it would have been tight to get a two times 10 gig system on this scale, particularly when we start talking about the internal hardware and the processor that this thing's rocking. But still, I'm not going to give it too much trouble given it has 10G off the bat and a couple of 2.5s in. Of course, the USB ports on this device, there's a lot of wide support of USB compatible devices from QNAP on the compatibility list. And much like the hard drives discussed earlier on, there is open compatibility on this in terms of connectivity there. Now, you can scale up the network connectivity if you choose. The two PCI slots inside here are both gen 3 times 4 each that's 4000 megabytes um a card to system connectivity for you to play with in terms of bandwidth there now um they have qnap have a range of their own 10g upgrade cards four port 2.5g cards dual port to uh, 10g cards 25 gigabit ethernet cards there are even melanex 40 gig cards that are supported on this device which means this system has a huge amount of scalability in terms of its network connectivity and you've still got two to play with notwithstanding the qm2 cards also allow you to combo in cards that have got both 10gbe and M2 NVMe slots inside to later add more storage tiers inside and better network connectivity. With a card like this inside there on the 3 times 4 lane, you're going to do well. And ultimately, it means that scalability of this solution, both in the storage and in the external bandwidth, is pretty impressive. Although the default level is maybe a mite below what I, that I would have liked to see for an ASFA 1400 nigger. It's not terrible, and I think where we really have to go next to see where the money is going to be made for the bolt clippers out here, we've got to get ourselves a screwdriver and start making our way inside. All right, we've got the last screw coming off of here, so let's take a little look what exactly it looks like underneath the bonnet here. Remove that from there. I apologise for how close that was against the mic. And there you go, first thing that hits me going through this is a vast amount of ventilation. There is a lot of space inside that chassis. Given how compact the whole thing is, I'm kind of surprised just how much room and space there is inside this thing. Now, if we look at the main gubbings here on the side, because that's really what we care about, we can take a little look out of that main cage fan affair here. Now, there is our giant heatsink there alongside a dedicated network controller for the 10GBE there at the top. And underneath there, if we bring that lovely and close at an angle, you can make out the top of those memory modules there, which are UDIM long memory sticks there. And there at the top, we have got the two M2 NVMe bays there at the top and again the written review linked in the description we've got a lot more of the takedown of this device overall but i think what we should do is go ahead and remove that big old fan there at the top because we do want to have a little look at what exactly is going on underneath that fan panel Put that down there get that out and there we go so inside if we ever so gently remove that fan we can take a little look what's going on underneath there so Quite a clean layout, I'd say, overall. Um, straight away, it's worth touching on, firstly, the M2 NVMe slots. As mentioned, those are Gen 3 times 4 So whether you're going to utilise those for your own standalone OS drives on there, if you're going to be utilising them for uh, caching, or you're going to be utilising them in Q-tier, you've got a lot of options available to you. And now that Q-tier allows you to take advantage of multiple different storage tiers, uh, you know, up to three on this device, that allows you to create a single storage pool comprising three different media storage types altogether, and then the system intelligently moving data to the NVMEs, to the SATA SSDs, or to the slower SATA hard drives as the system sees data being accessed more frequently. The result is the perfect self-regulated uh, um, tiered system with hot, warm and cold storage all being done by the system automatically there in the background which is lovely to see and again we were never going to see Gen 4 on a system like this that CPU doesn't support it and then at this price point we knew it was going to be Gen 3 but at the very least they're not bottleneck they're Gen 3 times 4 slots there now one thing that I do find a little bit underwhelming is the memory it arrives with that UDIM memory stick in there and it's an 8 gig UDIM stick, so 3200, uh, I believe, megahertz stick there. Have a quick look. It is, yep, a 3200 UDIM, and a, it is a Transcend 
TS1GLH64V2B3 for those that want to Google. But there's three empty slots. Now, why have I got such a beef with uh, one memory stick? Well, we'll talk about it a little bit more in the software section, but 8 gig does restrict some of the ZFS appliances of QUTS to be taken to their highest degree because QTS running on its own is a little bit memory hungry to start with. And 8 gigs, not a huge amount for the kind of storage and performance potential of this device. But moreover, it's not ECC. Now, this is non-ECC memory, despite the fact that this CPU that we're going to talk about in a moment does support ECC memory. Now, to stay within that price point, maybe QNAP could argue that the reason they put ECC memory in is they didn't want to spike the price up. And the minute you introduce ECC memory off the back, this isn't actually a flash NAS. It, you would have to continue down the road of ECC memory, technically, to upgrade beyond that. I have a slightly different opinion, and that is, again, as I mentioned earlier on, the $1,400 price tag I saw for this feels a little higher than it should be, and I think I'd feel slightly less resentful of that if this included ECC memory instead of that 8 gig non-ECC. But still, nonetheless, you can scale it up to a staggering 128 gig of memory, which when you're talking about virtualization, especially with this processor that we're going to talk about in a, git, in a bit, is absolutely mwah, chef's kiss. And I just, I, I'm so ambivalent about 8 gig of memory, but the scalability to 128 and ECC... It, it's just mixed messaging to me. It's great news, poorly packaged. Now, the CPU is an 8-core Intel Atom. Uh, now, it's the Intel Atom C5125. It was released at the tail end of 2022. So it's not even a year old, this processor. It is an 8-core, eight 8-thread eight processor with a 2.8 gigahertz clock speed. It doesn't have integrated graphics, but it's a workhorse processor. Now, Intel Atom, about five, six years ago, it fell over, frankly. It went through something of a PR disaster, and that was when uh, the C2538, I might have got that number wrong, ha was reported to have uh, RAID issues. When it was supported, it had uh, failures, which was then when it was utilized in a NAS, resulted in the CPU either being intermittent or dying and breaking RAID configurations. And for a while, NAS brands, Synology, QNAP, and others, that had been utilizing that CPU. It was a very small percentage chance that it could happen to you, but they started elongating the warranty. They also started migrating away from that processor quite quickly. But outside of that incident, the majority of Intel Atom processors be they going into the Deviton and other families were really good workhorse processors and what they did was give you high file performance without having to go Xeon what's wrong with Xeon well Xeon's incredibly expensive being the you know desirable server processor at enterprise level but also it has a substantially higher TDP ultimately making it a much greedier power processor now this ain't no slouch it's rocking a 50 watt reported TDP, and again, that's theoretical maximum. And when the system's in operation, power consumption is also not small. With the power consumption, if I look at my notes here off screen, still pretty darn high with a 250 watt PSU there in the background. It's not going to be a low power consuming device, but it's still going to make less of an impact than a Xeon. So with this CPU, also with its advantages towards virtualization and VM supported hosts, thanks to this generation of Atom in the C5000 series, it's a great choice of processor to be inside here, not only because of the number of lanes it provides for you to have a PCIe Gen 3x4 slot here, a PCIe Gen 3x4 slot on the other side, and those two PCIe Gen 3x4 M2 NVMe slots still leaving room and enough lanes for those eight um, SATA base there in SSD and hard drive. There's a lot to be grateful for on this and still managing to maintain four slots of UDIM memory there. That CPU is carrying a lot of the weight of this system. And I think, arguably, of all the components inside this device that are up in that price tag, I would say that pretty bloody new CPU is one of the biggest causes of it. But having all this hardware at your disposal, it's not the end of the world, is it? Because you want to know what you can do with that. And I think now we have to talk a little bit about QTS and QUTS software.
Now, in terms of software, I could go through the full software on this device. And if I did that, this video would be about three times longer. I could try and bullet point it, but ultimately there's just such a scope of software potential available on the TS855X brackets tank out there with QTS that it's just easier to go through the bullet points while it's there on screen. I will say I've done a full review of QTS and QUTS, that is the EXT4 and the ZFS versions of their software on this channel already, and they are linked in the description and they're there on screen. So if you wanna get to real grips and dig down deep, we've got some 50 minute hour long software overviews of the software available on this link. But to give you the highlights, overall the software itself, although not quite, as smooth and user-friendly as its biggest competitor DSM from Synology, it has to be said that QTS is incredibly high featured, both in the first and the third party. The GUI is a lot slicker than it's ever been. The range of uh, hardware and services straight off the bat, whether you are going EXT4 or uh, ZFS are huge number of RAID options. And again, that includes triple parity RAID and things like RAID resilvering are readily available to you if you go for the ZFS option there. Now, the 8 gig of memory this arrives with, although nice as a default sum, if you go for the ZFS option, it kind of removes some of the features. So if you are going to use things like inline data deduplication or even inline compaction, chances are you're going to need to upgrade that memory from the 8 gig to at least 16 gig to really take advantage of them. Now, when I mentioned inline, ZFS brings to the table things like inline data compression, where data, as it is written to the system, is readily compressed into the system to save more space. Inline deduplication is when data coming from multiple sources that's being backed up onto the NAS. When the same data is in multiple locations, it saves one copy but keeps a record of where that copy needs to be retrieved from later. And inline compaction is more to do with flash storage use, where data, again, is crushed and compacted down in terms of how it is written. Overall, the ZFS options for this, be they on QNAP's own applications, for business, for virtual machines, for uh, coming into H, uh, QTS 5.1, things like high availability down the line, and um, whether you're going to be utilizing this for, again, virtualization with virtual machines on the first party app, virtualization station, where you can download pre-existing VMs, or you're going to be using your existing VMware or Hyper-V environments and migrating it over. You can do that very easily, notwithstanding that you can also take advantage of Linux Station that allows you within three clicks to have up and running multiple uh, Linux VMs on this system very easily. This container support in Container Station that allows you to run huge numbers of contained, lower resource consuming and easy to adapt containers from within the GUI there. You can create a multi-user environment with all the different users and all of the different groups all having their own privileges and access. When it comes to security, not only has it got multi-tiered security now with malware protection uh, running all time in the background, antivirus protection there running in the background and lots of security counselors that you can run for more tailored alerts on this system. We've also got support of things like two-step authentication and um, rules that can be set to all individual users uh, access to be changed or given permissions and delegation temporary on the fly or force them to have to change their password regularly on the system on the fly. Now when it comes to utilizing this device in a larger business scale environment, it supports third-party existing SaaS or um, software as a service and PaaS platform as a service um, um, options out there, such as Google Workspace and Office 365 and existing cloud platforms. This could be integrated in very, very well with things like Box. So, indeed, one of the other things I saw at Synology, uh, sorry, uh, QNAP's own event over in Taipei is that they're now starting to roll out their own. Um, uh, partner cloud platform in my QNAP Cloud One that's going to have at least 12 locations around the world for you to have an off site backup that's still kept first party and encrypted. Now, one of the things that QNAP has had a real problem trying to shake the smell off for a while is ransomware. They, and along with a few other brands, uh, TerraMaster and Acer Store, were targeted by a ransomware group a year and a half, close to two years ago. Um, by this group, Deadbolt, and they managed to successfully attack lots of QNAP devices back then. Now, 
a lot of the vulnerabilities there could be pointed at several factors. It was uh, They were pointing fingers at the brand themselves for not uh, creating robust and secure backend on one or two of the particular apps, but also users that were not regularly updating their firmware were also impacted, punching holes in then um, uh, port and just ultimately creating a system that had a slight loose door to the rest of the internet to be exploited with ransomware. Whichever way you look at it, and also the way QNAP handled that afterwards with forced updates did not please a lot of people and frankly pissed a lot of people off. So the big question for a lot of users is, should is now okay to go to QNAP or have they still got the stench of ransomware on them? Well, Ultimately, I still think it will be several years before QNAP are able to shake off that stench. However, for local network access only, is bulletproof. If you're going to be using remote access credentials, there are lots of first and third party ways for you to create remote access on this. Everything from Tailscale down to my QNAP Cloud, all of which can be strengthened substantially. And talking of sp um, strengthened substantially, we can talk about QTS after the Deadbolt ransomware attack, all the changes to the default structure and the powers to the end user that can be switched on or off or ignored you know, to their detriment have been hugely strengthened and it is a lot harder to set the NAS up in a particularly unsecure way unless you are actually trying to do so. The QNAP will actively say, by doing this, you are putting yourself in an unsafe site. And that combined with both the notification center and the security advisory running simultaneously has substantially strengthened things. I just think it will still be a while before they can get rid of that horrible stench of ransomware. But the software itself for the multitude of client applications, for the multitude of first party applications, for uh, cloud gateways, enjoying your data internally for virtual machines, and of course, surveillance with QVR Pro are all going to be beneficial and desirable to a lot of users out there who want to take advantage of a large scale private storage system rather than opting to go for a cloud subscription service or at least a cloud gateway where all of your devices are communicating with the NAS and the NAS in the background is communicating with the cloud system there and in the event oh no we've lost the internet no one in the local area network will need to worry because it's all getting backed up ultimately in terms of the software that's a big part of the price tag on this thing whether you're looking at their own applications or how well it integrates with those third-party ones in your home in your own existing office environment it's a good well put together software store solution that is often some might say overlooked due to its failings over ransomware in the past and also one that can be inconsistent sometimes, although things have improved. If you do too much on the QTS platform, you do start to notice inconsistencies. Not massive, but there's certainly, it lacks some of the smoothness of Synology's DSM platform there. But that's enough talking about the software there. Let's get this to the conclusion and figure out whether the TS855X is the right NAS for you. The QNAP TS855X tank, it's a surprisingly well put together NAS. I'm really surprised given how much I overlooked it and how little we've heard about this NAS online, just how well this is as an overall package, notwithstanding that eight core Atom CPU, which is one of the newer generation Intel processors out there that isn't a Xeon in the market right now. This slips very neatly overall between Xeon powered NAS systems and Intel core NAS systems in their network environment and or not their, uh, their network portfolio there. Um, this system arriving again with up to 128 gig of memory, which is a dang shame there's only eight to start with and it's not ECC. It's still a great scalability, and scalability is the name of the game on this. From the triple tier storage system inside, man, I wish they were U.2, to the scalability of the network, uh, the uh, local USB or external SAS card expansion devices, to the tremendous amount of network connectivity you can scale up on this with PCIe upgrade cards and the default 10 GBE scalability is the name of the game on this system. And given its compact nature, it's surprising just how far you can stretch this thing's muscles. It's not perfect though. First and foremost, as good as that CPU is in terms of file management and handling, again, with tw uh, dual port 25 gigabit ethernet cords, QNAP say that you can crank out 3,505 megabytes per second sequential read and 2,288 megabytes per second sequential write, but that was on an SSD portfolio, uh, SSD profile. The CPU, is a bit power hungry. It might not be as power hungry as some of the higher end Xeons at the more expensive tiers, but that processor nonetheless with a 50 watt TDP rating there 
and just the huge amount of ventilation means it's not only going to be a bit noisy but it's going to be power hungry too so this isn't going to be a NAS for users that are going to start small this is for people that are going to fully populate and take advantage of its hardware off the bat it's a good system it is tremendously scalable but it is a workhorse NAS that if you're not using it in any other anything else than a workhorse capacity you will be left thinking this thing's noisy it's using a lot of power so just know that it's built to work hard but unless you're going to be pushing it you may be better off spending your money elsewhere and maybe saving a few hundred solves along the way but this has been our review of the TS855X we've got a couple more videos coming up on this comparison we do some software performance testing do let me know in the comments the kind of things you want to see we could do some benchmarking on this and we probably will but given it's an external 10g we know it can max out 10g and we don't have any of the 25 gig cards available here in the studio so benchmarking externally will be very tough and indeed with only six sata bays and two sata ssd bays there at the top that's still not a huge amount of potential with that expandability but we will look into benchmarking if you really really need us to but if you want to learn more, the written review on this now should be live relatively soon and there should be a link in the comments. If you want to learn more, then you can find out more guides on other NASs that have been revealed to us in 2023. And of course, further content on this will be linked hopefully by YouTube on the side of the screen. And finally, if you need help with your data storage solution, use the free advice section over on NAS Compares, the big blue button on the right hand side. You can use the free community support forum at Ask NAS Compares, or you can use our Discord to get answers to your questions. Finally, if you found this video helpful and if you were going to shop at stores like eBuyer, um, Amazon, eBay, um, B&H, any of those stores, they're all linked in the description. And if you use those links, they will take you to those stores and anything you buy, and I mean anything you buy, it results in a kickback coming to here at NAS Compares. It's just me and Eddie here at NAS Compares doing what we do and it really helps us out. But don't do that unless you've enjoyed the video, found it helpful, and you were going to go to those shops anyway. But thank you so much for watching, and have yourselves a great week.